school and bilingualism and what that looks like in the deaf school. And now I'm going to explain our Science of Learning Center. I'm Melissa Herzig and uh, talking about bilingual and I, I call it at university. I'll be going into what that the lifespan benefits are. So visual language and visual learning, which is the science of learning funded by NSF. And I see a lot of similarities when it comes to bilingualism and the visual language and visual learning paths. And I'm just like, wow, I can't believe how much similarities that we have and the goals and the purpose and what we want to do are similar with bilingualism. I feel like we're parallel and we should intersect at some point and work together because they're almost identical. And so this is the reason why I do this. I think it's really cool. And this is our Science of Learning Center that I, I founded in 2006. Almost the same year that bilingualism was set up was it 2008. So only you, you're, you're celebrating their 10 year anniversary. We, are, we just celebrated ours two years ago. So funded again by NSF, we are one of six science of learning centers that are funded by NSF. The other five science of learning centers um, are a network of researchers, different universities working together, but their goals and their focus on what they study and what they research are very different. Our focus is on visual language, visual learning. Our focus is we want to understand how, well, what kind of impacts. Like if, if we learn things, if we just learn things through visual means instead of auditory means, it's kind of like the, a lot gets lost. And the, the impact that it has on the, the cognition and the brain development. And what we want to know is what happens in our brain? What kind of impact does it have on our cognitive development? And when we sign, when we don't sign, what does that look like? And if we learn sign language later in life, not early, what does that look like in the brain? Does it look different than the spoken language because it's visual? There's just a bunch of questions that we have, kind of like how bilingualism has questions that they needed to ask based on the public's concepts or views in regards to language and the learning. There's a bunch of questions and a lot of misconceptions. So they went ahead and got those questions out there and found all the misconceptions and studied them. So we're essentially doing the same thing. And what we want to know is how does sign language impact the brain? And if we hold back sign language and we focus on the spoken language, is that better? Or is that actually worse? We just don't know. So we're studying all the different questions we have. And we work collaboratively. So from what we understand, it does not just benefit deaf children. What we've learned has been amazing. I mean, with all the questions that we've asked and the answers that we got really helped us understand the human brain and what we're capable of, not just the deaf brain or just language, but really more than that, it goes beyond, you know, what's, what's elastic and what's not, you know, with the brain. And when it comes to development and language learning and develop in general, helped us really understand just how the human brain really works and how that translates into learning and social skills and learning different languages and communicating with one another just across the entire lifespan. So with VL squared is what we call it, it's not just visual language, and it's not just us that's doing this. We've partnered with a lot of researchers, and I see a lot of you here that I've worked with. I mean, I see Karen that I've worked with. Um, 
Morford. The posters are here, but I don't see her here. I thought I'd see her. Jill Morfield, yeah, she's she's not here. Um, I just yeah, a lot of familiar faces here who helped with our study, and we worked collaboratively with a bunch of different people. I'm just going to give a couple of examples. I really can talk all day about this. I This is my passion. But I, I picked some questions that I thought were amazing, that I thought you guys would enjoy. And here are some of the answers. So number one, it's a common belief that in order to learn to read, the best way is through sound, which is auditory input. You know, there's phonology, sound phonological uh, knowledge that would help with decoding, which helps with sound print and connection, and it helps with reading. That's the general belief that in order to read, you have to hear. So. There's the cochlear implant that was pushed upon the deaf community to encourage them to speak. So, okay, well, you know, if that didn't work, then you can learn sign language later. So my second question was, when is the best age for second language introduction? If sign language is learned later in life, then when is the best time to learn what age? And that question applies to any other language, not just sign language. So let's just say you want to, let's say English is the language at home and they learn a second language later in school, at school, right? They have to build a foundation first. And like I mentioned earlier, I see a lot of similarities when it comes to bilingualism in the community out there and the deaf children oftentimes parents will say, oh, we need to focus on the spoken language and they'll push upon that so then they don't sign. And then eventually when the children learn sign language, they will use that more than the English that they've learned. So the resources in the brain splits and it breaks out and they're not um, proficient in one language. So we, 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 we did a lot of research when it came to that. Erica did mention a lot of struggles when it comes to language. What was the word? Yeah, the semi, semi-lingual, meaning they're not proficient in one language. So in English, it's, it's a huge struggle. It's a huge struggle to learn English. And not just English, but ASL. They struggle to learn ASL. And the belief is because they don't have the sound. Through, through behavior study and monitoring, we looked at a family. And this child was hearing, but has a d deaf parents, deaf mother and a deaf father, and learned sign language with the mom and learn spoken English at school. So we thought that the child would want to focus on the spoken language and not the visual language because they developed their initial language in visual and then pretty much abandoned it for the spoken language. But the milestones that we monitored, they were very much visual language learners. They did the vowel, the constant combinations, the rhythm in ASL, that matched up with the hand babbling and with the talking. And as they were babbling and talking, it, was, it wasn't exactly the same time, but it was around the same time period where they were able to pick up on both the signing plus the spoken language. So the brain doesn't have any preference. It does not focus on one over the other. It's just that there was a, there's no huge delay or anything like that. It's just at when babies are they're able to pick up on two languages or even more in fact their brains really want that they really want more they love learning more than one language the brain just acquires so much at that age now when you look at a deaf child a deaf baby who has access to sign language they hit the same milestones with the the hands babbling and the the trying to sign 
And when they start reading in letter and print and through finger spelling or through pointing, like they process and hit the same milestones, which was very interesting. So it shows that just because you can hear or not, it doesn't matter. Parents think that they have to wait in order to get their baby a cochlear implant. And usually at 12 months old is when they get their surgery to get that cochlear implant. So what happened from birth to 12 months old? What kind of input did they see or understand or get? We don't have enough access to that. We don't have clear access to that. So they miss a lot of those milestones. When they're not signing the words, they get the cochlear implant at 12 months and they're training them already to, to speak, to make that connection, and they're starting at a later age. So babbling, like I mentioned earlier, is what we really studied on. And at six months old, the, bab the hand babbling started. So in babies, right here, it says hand babbling at six months old. Petito did that research back in 1991. And it was just by chance they thought at first that they were just moving the hands. But no, they found out that there was rhythm and it matched up to the 1.5 megahertz. And it was the pattern, just like with spoken language, there were patterns and there's rhythm. So they compared that to babies who had no exposure to sign language whatsoever. And nothing. Their hand movements, there was no rhythm. It was like a 3.0, 4.0, HRZs. And that they were just moving their hands. So there was no rhythm. So that's what, in fact, they discovered babbling, hand babbling specifically. So that's the type of rhythm that the brain needs in order to, to pick up the language because that then helps them later in life when it comes to reading and language acquisition. This is a behavior study that we, we studied off of with the hand babbling and the milestones and everything. And now neuro neurologically, we wanted to know where does the sign phonology come happen in the brain? So we did a study, or P Petito did a study, excuse me, for d on deaf adults who were born to deaf parents, deaf family, and they, they've been signing. They did not depend on the sounds that they were able to hear. So I thought, okay, well, that means the signing will then oppress the, uh, I should say, it'll atroph atrophic in the brain, which is what we thought. Because we thought sound phonology would outweigh the actual signing. So according to this study, they had MRI tests done. And the, the phonology with the words, the sounds, were activated in the right places. And with the deaf, they could see that, and it was activated. And even the smallest part of sign language, which didn't have a meaning, it happened in the exact same place. If you look over here at the picture of the MRIs, I mean, look at that. It's just, it did not atrophy. It's still active in that area, which is awesome, which means the brain was able to pick up a modality, whether it was sign language or the spoken language. And that's a huge discovery that really helped raise the status of ASL. And ASL has always been looked at like a cultural language, which it is a language. There's grammar, there's rules, there's structure, and it's also a part of a culture. But they never looked at it as e equal to a spoken language. Spoken language always was of utmost importance, and visual language was, uh, it was cool. Yeah, I gave you access, but it wasn't as important as spoken language. But according to this MRI and this study, it's a necessity. Biologically, it's, it's equivalent. So that is our struggle and our concern. When students come into middle school, as Erica had mentioned, when they go to the deaf school, 
I think it was what, 75% you said, 65%. Okay, 65% um, percent of the students that transition into the middle school or even the high school, that they learn sign language at that age, which means they've missed out on their early language acquisition. And let's say a person decides they want to learn sign language later and they, the parents want to focus on the spoken language and if it doesn't work, sign language is easy. They can learn it at a later age is commonly what people think. Whoops. All right, let me just find my place. All right, well, that's fine. So um, individuals who learn sign language later in life, um, and really the basic point is, is uh, the brain wants something. It wants that rhythm. It wants uh, you know, to be able to understand the world in, through any way possible. And it doesn't matter the modality. All right, and we'll just keep going right here. And so, um, you know, there are many issues with uh, you know, children, deaf, especially in uh, deaf children, um, you know, trying to encourage them to learn sign language later in life. And you all know that um, when a children learn language early in life, they just take off. They, their reading and comprehension skills just take off, and they do really well in life, especially education-wise. So the earlier that they learn language, the better. And, you know, that idea of learning sign language later is, you know, it, it becomes a second language in high school. You know, they can take it uh, as an elective or a foreign language in high school. And, I mean, in high school, that's when they start learning that language. And, um, you know, that happens frequently here in America. So, and we've learned that um, it really doesn't, it shows up in the same place, the language area in the brain, and I have a picture of this. It's, uh, you know, the sound and the uh, visual phonology um, were triggered in the same part of the brain, and that's the language part of the brain. But we've learned that um, what's important is if you learn later, learn the language later in life, it's not in the language part of the brain. It's at a different place in the brain. And it's part of your working memory in the temporal area. And so there's, if you don't have a purpose for that second language, then, you know, maybe you'll forget it. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Or um, maybe if you go to another country and immerse yourself in that culture, that's, you know, one way of um, having that language. Um, and that will become part of your long-term memory. And of course, you will become more and more fluent. But ASL, but, but not native. You will still have that accent or a dialect. Um, and so it's very dependent on that. You won't necessarily be fluent like you were, like a native child who speaks the uh, language natively. Um, but you, and you, as you get older, you'll think about the language use. And so that means for deaf students who learn sign language later in life, you know, it's not, their language is not in the language part of the brain. They have to think about sign language. They have to really put um, effort into uh, building upon that and English as well. And so um, it's in, that falls mainly in the subject area of the brain. And um, it puts a lot of responsibility on the brain, you know, to not only learn language itself, but, you know, having it in a different area of the brain. And oh, I was a professor as well. I taught high school, actually. And I often saw students um, who had a severe lag in language. They were not 
um, you know, fluent in any language. But if you give them a reason for learning that language or, um, you know, they will be motivated and um, they'll have purpose for it to remember it and they won't forget it as easy. And of course, you know, repetition is key. So if we have that idea of holding back language, it, you know, causes a serious disadvantage for deaf children and causes a great lag in their education. And the, it's the same with um, bilingual people or bilingual speakers, you know, especially if they learn a language later in life, they have that one language that will help influence the other language and it can be tough. So I really strongly encourage the fact that, you know, earlier is better and you don't want to hold off and, you know, learn language later in life because, you know, there's so much potential that the children have when they learn the language early on multiple. and multiple language at that too. And it helps with um, various areas of life, you know, cognitive development and um, so on and so forth. And so um, we want deaf children to become proficient at reading and uh, literacy. We want that for them. You know, we want them to do well in academics. And uh, we strong, as long as they have the clear access early on in life, then they'll be fine later. And, you know, really we're hoping for, um, you know, to <coughs> collaborate with some other professionals on this on bilingualism and because um, we have a sense of urgency for these kids. You know, these, these children can't wait. They're going to end up misunderstanding things and there's going to be a lot of miscommunication in life and um, how, making them practice that later is just not fair and it's not right. You know, they should be able to communicate and uh, communicate vastly. So basically, my basic point is the earlier the better. So when it comes to bilingualism, it matters. And the belief in research and find the information and communicate that with people. Visual language learners, we do the same thing. We, we work together with different researchers. We value their work. And we can't just research and publish. We have to communicate that research. And we have to select the most important parts of that research and, and consolidate all of that research into two to three pages or points based on all that research that's available out there. And it's not just presenting the information, but it's kind of like how these are the different ways we, we educate everybody. There's 11 different, I actually have some in my bag if you want some. I have some briefs for the teachers and stuff like that. But it's very important that we communicate clearly with the parents. And obviously, it depends on our target audience. We can't just say, hey, research says this, this, and that. We have to really be careful and be sensitive about what they are going through. You know, they just found out that their baby is deaf. They're, they're shocked, they're stunned. So we have to redevelop their thinking. You know, a, a deaf baby is not something that you need to fix. It's just a different language that you have to learn. And the family can learn a new language, which is awesome. And that's a lot of benefit for just one family. It's, we try to be more encouraging and we try to shift the perception of their baby because their deaf baby is gonna add so much value to life if given a chance. And you don't have to choose just one language. You can pick multiple languages. There are different modalities, different ways to communicate with your child. But I do have the education and research translation. And I, I, this is just all based on the research I've collected. We've obviously going to have more research that comes into play in the future. I also have a great team that we developed. We developed tangible resources that families are able to use in their home. There's a bilingual storybooks that we've came across. They have apps 
for that, that they can sign and they have the English form in there. And we translate that story, I think it's into six different languages now. We have Japanese sign language with the Japanese spoken language. We have, uh, I believe it's the Netherlands sign language with the written form. We are working on the um, Saudi Arabic sign language that would also with written form in their language. We have Russian sign language with the Russian written form. So different languages that we're trying to, to press upon. We also are not gonna stop just at the research and the translation, but we are actually training future researchers through our PhD program in educational pro-science. So we're trying to train them and get them thinking about researching and how to communicate that research with the general public. And we have um, a, co a coalition with 17 universities. I did not realize UCR was one of them. I actually don't think they are, I th but it's a goal that I'd like to have. So I can send students to the different labs during the summer cognitive lab and they're able to do that research. One of our students actually went to Karen's lab last summer and she said she had such a great experience there. So we'd like to keep that collaboration going. So if, sorry, there's a fly over here by the interpreter. I'm so sorry. She's so distracted because I'm waving. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I know you want, I thought, I know, I'm sorry. I'm so Okay, well that obviously was a deaf thing. <laughs> I've got good peripheral vision. I'm looking at my interpreter like, what did you need? <laughs> okay, so, um, so we're committed to this. This is our goal, to communicate and to continue research. And so we are highly motivated and we wanna work with other universities out there. I just really love the idea of bilingualism patterns that are out there and I wanna network and I, cause I think it's right up our alley and hopefully we can work together in the future. Thank you so much.